Thanks, Terry. Thanks to the team up at the back making all this all possible. So uh, I really appreciate uh, yeah, all that they do. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we are continuing our journey on Romans uh, to, to look at this, this letter that you encouraged Paul to write to a church in Rome, uh, to encourage others to keep a copy of this letter, to bring it together with others that were written by Paul and Peter and James and John, to bring it together with the gospel accounts to what we eventually form what we call the New Testament and to preserve that so that today we're able to look at it, we're able to read it, we're able to, to think about it and ask that question, what is it you want to say to us today, Lord? So, Holy Spirit, please help us to have an open heart, an open minds and, a, and allow you to actually work in us. May we engage with your message, Father, because you've created this moment for us, and I give you thanks for that. Amen. We, yes, so we are going to continue, and the clicker did work before, so I'm not sure if it's an active yet. There we go. So we are continuing in our series in Romans, so for, uh, for those visiting today, we uh, we are doing a series in Romans. You know, I've, I've boldly decided to go where a lot of lot more learned people have been before, uh, and see what, you know, try to unpack the book of Romans. And of course, to do it properly would take a, a few years. So I'm trying to condense that down. Whoops, I went backwards. And uh, so we're just going, we're going through section by section, and we're up into Romans three. Um, and it's uh, this is the part we're getting into the more comfortable stuff. Uh, to talk about as Christians. I mean, uh, up until now, Paul has been talking about uh, about those people out there. You know, he, he started off by talking, you know, to his readers, says, you know, those people out there. They, they, in, the, in his case, those Gentiles. You know, you know, are you seeing all the terrible things that they're doing? You know, you know, you know, all sorts of really terrible things. You know, God's letting them. Go ahead with that, and I'm sure the readers at that point were going, "Yeah, look how terrible they are," you know, and uh, and in real agreement. But then he flips it, and he starts talking about us, or in his case, the Jewish believers, um, who thought because of their Jewishness uh, that they were okay with God. And, and no, says Paul, um, uh, actually, you're just like them. And I can imagine a, you know, at that, that moment, you know, because he says in two one, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself, for you who judge others do these very same things. And that that's not necessarily that they were literally doing what the Gentiles were doing. But they were, dis you know, they were doing things that were contrary to what God was saying. Uh, or they may have been literally doing what the Gentiles were doing. So, you know, it's one of the problems. We, culture can impact you know, how we live rather than us impacting our culture. Um, so basically from 118 up until now, Paul has been talking about that wonderful conversational topic called sin. Uh, you know, it's, it may not be a popular topic. You know, uh, I'm not sure when was the last time he went up there and get you know said to someone, "Oh, hi sinner, how you going? What sort of sins have you been up to lately?" You know, um, or you know, you get up there and you know, it's, what have you been up to this week? Oh, just sinning. Yeah, yep. Oh, many little ones, but oh, last Tuesday, beauty. We, we don't tend to talk about sin very much. I mean, we, we much prefer, we'd rather talk about things like love and forgiveness and mercy and grace and acceptance. 
rather than sin. They are easier to talk about. Uh, but when you start talking about sin, you also start talking about things like separation, uh, responsibility for one's actions, you know, accountability, consequences, uh, standards, God's versus my worldview. And it's also linked with that equally unpopular topic, hell, which is the ultimate consequence of sin, being separated from God forever. Paul has also shown that keeping rules, even God's rules, cannot deal with this sin problem. In fact, uh, his rules, God's rules, as given in the Old Testament, were to highlight that we were sinners. Paul says, you know, just in the previous verse to this, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Now, I hope one day to ask Paul exactly why he spent so much time in his letter talking about sin. Uh, I also hopefully Paul's not going to get bored with that question. You know, he might have his FAQ sheet that he'll give out you know, to, you know, when someone meets him for the first time in heaven. You know, yep, I've been asked this question a million times already. Here it is. But I suspect that in Paul's day, just like today, people do not take breaking God's standard seriously. Few people see themselves really as sinners. And few actually stop to think about the seriousness of sin. I mean, I, you know, as I was thinking about this, I mean, I often say I'm a sinner saved by grace. And really what I'm saying is I love the grace. I, I don't really want to focus on the sinner part. And I think we can easily get caught up in that grace and forget about the fact that we are sinners saved by grace. And this is one of the reasons why it's hard, I think, to t when we talk about the need for Jesus. It's only when we acknowledge that we have sinned, that we've gone against God's values, that we can start to see the need for a saviour. It's when we recognise that there are, you know, there's no such thing as seven deadly sins. They're all deadly sins because they all separate us from God. And we can't fix them after they've happened. It's not until we realise the seriousness of sin that we can start to appreciate the immenseness of God's mercy to us. So having shown the serious, seriousness of sin, Paul says, but. And when we see or hear but, it's about to introduce an important counter to what has gone before. For example, I know what God says, but I'm sure he won't mind me doing this. I know what God says, but I'm going to do my own thing. Or I'd like to help, but, and fill in the blank. And it could be I'm in hospital and I can't get there. It could be I've got other things to do, or the reality is I don't really want to help. Or, I'm really tempted by this, but God says it's bad for me, so I'm not going to do it. So, but can be a good thing, you know, introducing that counter that's a good thing. And so here, Paul, I had to rephrase this, Paul's day, which is the Greek, uh, or but, is here to introduce an amazing counter to our problem with sin. And actually, he's already hinted at it back in uh, you know, chapter 1, verse 17, which I'll encourage you to go look back at. I'm not going to tell you. The good news is that God has made a way for those made in his image to be made right with him. Something that he said he will do. And if you don't believe it, go read the first five books of the Bible Go read the prophets, that's what Paul says, you know, <laughs> as, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. It is there, this good news that God has a plan to make us right with him. And that way is, is, is 
Paul makes really clear in verse 22, he says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. That's it. No following a set of rules, no performance standard required, no pre-testing required, no doing special rituals. It is faith. And as Paul says, this is for everyone who believes. And, and this reminds us that we can't say to God, oh, oh, God, I'm not good enough to follow you. We can't say that. None of us are actually good enough. Or we can't say, I don't know enough to follow you, Jesus. We'll never know enough. It doesn't come into the picture when it comes to being right with God. It's the simple answer to the question of whether I have faith that what Jesus did on the cross for me, for everyone else, is all that is needed. Because Paul says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. He doesn't say listening to what Paul says. He doesn't say by doing anything else. It's simply by faith in Jesus. He reminds us again, of course, that everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Uh, Romans 3.23, often well-quoted verse. You know, it's, it's one of those, probably those well-known verses in Romans. Uh, it tends to be trumped out a fair bit. Uh, but I like how 24 goes, yet, and this is the exciting part, God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. Again, this is a God thing, Paul's wanting to stress. This is what God is doing. It's not what I do. It's not, it's not about me. It's about what God is doing for me. God, out of his grace, freely makes us right with himself because of what Jesus did for you and me and for everyone else. And so, you know, what, one of the great things about, you know, talking about our faith is that, no, it's not about you have to come to church. It's not about that you, you have to give. It's, it's not about that, you know, you've, you've got to go through this uh, you know, induction process of welcome to church 101, then move on to, you know, being baptized 102, on to into church membership 103, and ministry 104 process or whatever. It's about faith in Jesus. And how do I respond to what God has done? The reason we are meant to meet together is not because we're told to, but because we're encouraged to in response to God's grace for us. Because God has given himself as the sacrifice for sin. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. Paul points out. And you know, it wasn't the soldiers, it wasn't Pilate, it wasn't the religious leaders who were in control and put Jesus on the cross. God himself arranged so that sin could be dealt with this. And Jesus went there willingly. Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood for us. And behind what Paul's saying here, people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood, is the Old Testament emphasis on the atonement of blood sacrifices. Uh, you know, Leviticus 17, 11, it says, I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. And of course, the New Testament constantly talks about how Jesus is... Death on the cross is our atoning sacrifice. 
Because as Paul rightly points out, uh, God simply couldn't leave sin unpunished indefinitely. That would be going against his nature. He does not condone sin. And he needed to deal with it. And the sacrificial death of Christ is that expression of God's sense of justice. We often talk about it being a sense of God's love, which it is. But it's also a reflection of God's justice. Sin needed to be dealt with. You know, it's, it's, it's not something that God is just going to go, oh, don't worry about it. God takes sin very seriously. Very seriously. More so than we do. And his plan to deal with it is Jesus. God has patiently refrained from fully punishing people's sins in the past because of his plan from the beginning to deal with sin once and for all in the death of his son, the ultimate expression of grace and the ultimate expression of justice. And that means that the things that we have done wrong have been dealt with. When we say, God, oh, I'm not good enough for you, what we're saying really is, God, I'm going to hang on to my, my sins and I'm going to try to deal with them myself because I'm denying that you actually nailed them to the cross when you went there. Because God is saying, I've dealt with that. I have dealt with that. Come and accept the gift of life that I offer. I've been set right with me because of what Jesus has done. And so Paul quite rightly says, well, can we boast then that we've done anything to be accepted by God? And he gives the answer, which I, I, I like how it's a rhetorical question. Paul says, no, of course not. Of course not. Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law or doing rules. It's based on faith. By the way, and that's, isn't this an amazing concept? That faith is a gift from God. So the faith we have in God is actually a gift from God because God helps us to have faith. I love that. We've got such an awesome God, you know. Oh, I'm not sure I can believe. Ask God to help you believe. And he will help you. Oh, I'm not sure I have enough faith. Ask God to give you the faith that you need. He will help you. This is the God we have. You know, it's 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 because it's not. I can't boast. I can't say oh, I've got enough faith to believe in God. No, it's a gift from God. You know, it's, you know, I, I'm I'm able to do all these things. Hey, I'm a I'm a preacher. Well, no, it's God's decided to call me and gift me the abilities to yak on. Uh, sometimes, probably, some people think a bit too long, but anyway, uh, it's a gift from God. The abilities, the resources, the things they have. I can't boast in them. They are a gift from God. <laughs> so Paul rightly says, no, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it's based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not obeying the law. You know, it, because salvation is a free gift and not something that we can ever earn, you know, there's really two important points that come out of this. First is there's actually no room for human pride. You know, the only boasting is what the Lord has done. You know, we receive salvation not because we've, you know, of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done. And we're going to celebrate that in communion shortly. And our trust must be in that alone. Salvation is always by grace alone, through faith alone, to God alone be the glory. There's a certain Latin word there, but I don't know my Latin, so I had to give the English version of that. There's actually no room for a person to say, I do my best, I try to live a decent right life, what more can God expect from me? That again is self-reliance. 
And the second thing, by the way, that Paul highlights is there's no preferential consideration between those keeping the law and, and, and those who don't. You know, the Gentiles, Paul's pointing out, were going to be accepted on the same basis as the Jews by faith in Jesus. Now, some want the rules. They know It means that they know what they can do and what they can't do. Unfortunately, we're really good at coming up with ways of working around rules. You ask any kid who's been told never to step over the line. Don't you step over that line. I'm not over the line. So obeying rules does not work. Getting right with God by obeying rules does not work. It is faith in Jesus alone. And out of that faith in Jesus alone do we live. After all, God is the God of the Jews only. No, he isn't. He's also the God of the Gentiles. You know, of course he is. And I love this statement. There's only one God. And again, Paul's hitting home the point. And he makes people right with God only by faith, whether they're Jews, Gentiles, Australian, Italian. I don't know why I picked on Italians, but you know, um, I could have said New Zealanders, I guess. Um, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your background. Faith alone. And that's the wonderful message that we have. That's the beauty of the church as well. That, that we are not linked to a, 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 a national background or whatever. Uh, like when Patina was here, you know, the, the, the expression in, in Thailand is to be Thai is to be Buddhist. We don't, we don't have that as Christians. We're part of God's family, irrespective of, of where I was born. There's no sort of nationalism in God's God's church. It's one amazing worldwide family of God. Anyway, that was a, that was a bit of divergent there. Uh, then it comes to the very end, and now because I'm sure that Paul's readers, who are predominantly probably you know Jewish, is the number of Jewish believers there going. Oh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, because we've always been taught to obey the rules, obey the law. You know, does, does this mean that we can forget about the laws of Moses? You know, and you know, it's, it's, it's what Paul's saying that you know the, the role of the law, God's role of the law, has just you know gone out the window. Uh, well, Paul says, no, of course not, of course not. You can't forget about the law, but rather your faith in Jesus actually will confirm it and endorse it because that's what Jesus did on the cross. So you see, when we have faith, we recognize that what Christ has done has actually validated the absolute demands of the moral law uh, that was in there. That you know, right through the Old Testament, God has said, you know, you you do wrong, you will need to that wrong will need to be paid for. There's there's going to be a judgment. You know, when he told the people, hey, look. Here's the hills on, on which, you know, you know, gave an example. This hill over there, it's full of blessings. You want to go over there, you'll be blessed. This is full of curses if you don't want to do what I ask you to do. Choose. And as human beings, what do we do? Uh, I think we'll go that way. It's, well, that needs to be paid. And that's what happened when Jesus on the cross. It also recognizes the deeper purpose, the true purpose of the law, which is namely to make us aware of our failings. And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we become aware, we become aware, wow, I really am a sinner. Before I became a Christian, my common statement was, I'm a good bloke. You know, yeah, I was, I was, I was a good bloke. Yeah, actually, I can, you could ask Faye. It, it used to frustrate her that I was a good bloke. You know, 
uh, in the sense of, I uh, hopefully didn't frustrate her in our marriage, but anyway, in the sense of trying to witness and saying, well, you know, because I was kind, I was considerate, I was caring, you know, all of those things. And I thought of myself as a good bloke. When I came to Christ, I realised I'm not that good. Christ is good. I'm not. And that's what Jesus' death on the cross has shown. And lastly, it confirms. It confirms that God considers people righteous based on their faith and nothing else. And I love how for Abraham, right back in Genesis 15, it says, And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Right at the very beginning, God is saying, faith makes you right with me. And that's what he wants to stress here. Faith makes you right with me. So if we've got into the rut of going to church, if we've got into the rut of doing you know, Christian things, we need to get out of that. And we need to come before God and acknowledge acknowledge who he is and our need for him and the fact that we are sinners only saved by having faith in what he's done on the cross for us. And that's the only thing that's going to save anybody else. So I'll leave you with some questions. I like this first one. How do you feel about God being fair and holding back from punishing sin? When it's your own sin and when it's someone that, someone's sin that affects me. This, this came at one of the commentaries, an interesting thing, and I thought, oh, yeah, because if someone does something wrong for me, my instant response is, God, why don't you do something about them now? <laughs> you know, I want God to step in right away and really, you know, fix that. <laughs> and as I'm reading this, I'm going, oh, yeah, but I do want him to be patient with me. I want him to be patient with me. Hmm, if I want him to be patient with me, Maybe I should be thankful that he's been patient with others and that, that one day they may too come to say, you know what, I'm a sinner. I need Christ to save me. Second question, how well do I understand the seriousness of sin and the immenseness of God's grace? The reason that is there because I believe you cannot really appreciate how awesome God's grace is to us until you realise how serious sin is. Because if you don't have a good view of, what, of the seriousness of sin, Jesus' sacrifice, you're not fully appreciating what Jesus has done. Something to ponder. And lastly, what does my thankfulness for what my Lord uh, ooh, has done? Good, I had to reread that in a second. Um, for those visiting, I have grammar problems. So there's often a grammar or spelling mistake. None today, which is, um, I think. What does my thankfulness for what my Lord has done look like? If I understand the immenseness of, you know, the seriousness of sin and the immenseness of God's grace, well, what does my thankfulness look like? Three questions today. We are very privileged. Jesus has revealed himself to us. We've recognised that we are sinners and we recognise that only he can save us. Let's take the seriousness of sin seriously, but let's also just be in awe of his grace for us.